Hello, French Polynesia. Hello to fellow seasteaders and hello to everyone else from the world that traveled here to hear what our plans are for the future. Um, looking at the trends that are happening all over Earth, um, not only floods, but also droughts, uh, enormous growth of population and cities, there is a very big challenge that is ahead of us, and we really need to dra uh, dra dra uh, radically change the way how we look at developments. This is why we have been looking at, at which objectives and principles uh, we have that um, are in line with the blue revolution that Bart shortly told about and that we will use as a starting point for our developments. So first of all, we wanna create value for not only people and p profits, but also for the planet. And by doing so, we believe that we will create even more value. Then our baseline is to be total, uh, fully energy self-sufficient. This means that we won't, won't take any energy from fossil fuels, but we will produce it ourselves locally. And ideally, we produce even more so we can give it back to the island. The principle of circular economy. Uh, considering every part of the construction uh, sequence and even thinking already about the end of life of the project, of um, the function that is there. By doing so and thinking of it during the design, we can already make it in a way that it's far easier to take apart and reuse. This brings me to the waste to resource um, uh, principle, where we look at all sorts of um, resources that are uh, produced in a development or city. Think of our domestic wastewater, think of um, waste like um, paper or vegetables or all these things aren't actually waste. We can reuse them, reuse them in a way that they become resources again. And last but not least, ecological restoration. By already thinking up front what we want to offer and what we want to um, increase in terms of ecology, which animals or which types of, of other habitats we want to um, make better, we can uh, uh, pre-design that during our design phase and install it really easy. For example, using certain um, small areas for fish to grow or using a specific type of uh, material that is good for corals. These principles led to building a met methodology, which we call the environmental assessment framework. The assessment framework is um, uh, oriented around this spatial plan, which is on one side influenced by the maximizing the benefits and also partly limited by the risks that can occur. On the right side, we see um, the C zone and control zone. In, in order to make um, a new environmental impact assessment as regime, where we will look at, uh, we, um, we have developed a four-step approach. This means that we will define a C zone that uh, will have an environmental impact assessment regime of its own. That means that it will uh, comply to all the principles I just uh, showed you, and so on. Um, so the first step is to, be, to define a C zone. The next step, what we need to do is define control zones. So we can um, see if the changes that are happening within the C zone are not caused by us, but by, uh, um, or if it, I'm, again, so if anything negative can happen in that area, we want to make sure it's not caused by us, but it can, can be caused by uh, ex external uh, sources. And if it is caused by us, we will try to uh, adjust it. The third step is to uh, quantify uh, the influence we expect to have. And um, I, I was talking uh, um, um, the day before yesterday with one of the research researchers here from uh, from the islands, and, and he told me that it's really important to have um, the, the four um, 
basic um, levels of of the trophic uh, of a tr the, the <laughs> Balance in the trophic levels. So uh, the balance between the coral and the algae and the balance between herbivore and carnivore. So we need to think of upfront what this balance is and what it should be and how we can influence that in a, in a positive way. And the last step will be to, uh, to be able to evaluate these benchmarks. We need to monitor it by using uh, different kinds of technologies. Uh, this is what Bart already showed uh, before. <laughs> um, on the other hand, the development characteristics of the project will feed into this framework. So think of size, the uh, shape, the depth, the density of the, of the project and the platforms will all have an influence on these ecological parameters. The ecological parameters are... Um, are parts are um, characteristic of the of the ecology <laughs> um, that will have in some way uh, experience and influence of, from my project. I will show you a few examples on how we have approached this for a few parameters. So first, we look at the project characteristics that that influence the environment. We assess the impact that could happen to these specific habitat types. Then design recommendations follow to reduce the negative and potentially increase the positive ones. And finally, to monitor these rec uh, uh, monitoring recommendations to assess if these benchmarks are met. For example, the light intensity that is used for, by animals um, to, for photosynthesis to produce food uh, for life um, is, uh, is something that, is, that will be influenced by every single aspect of the uh, development. Uh, it is really important to, to keep this, uh, uh, one, this is one of the most important characteristics that we should keep in mind. So the light intensity is something that uh, will, will, for example, be blocked Part of the light will be reflected. And if we look what happens now, that eight, normally 85% of the light penetrates the water. So one of the most important design recommendations we have is that we should test every project we have up front on the shape uh, and size and see how much shade it produces and if this will be a permanent shading. Because if we have no light at all, that would be uh, something we don't really want. Uh, so this is one of the, des uh, the design recommendations uh, from this. Moreover, we should have platforms that have at least a, a little bit of space between it to allow enough solar radiation. Long, slim platforms, for example, have, uh, that are oriented north-south cast less shadows than square ones. That's an interesting topic because usually square ones are more interesting in terms of uh, how they uh, float and how they behave in the water. So this is something that would it'd be interesting to test. And uh, we could also use rotating platforms, so which are not fixed at one point, but could move uh, in order to still allow enough water, enough light to penetrate the water. And there's another interesting uh, thing about shading. It could have positive benefits in terms of temperature. Oh, something happened here. So temperature is another um, environmental characteristic that, is, um, that we studied. Um, we, during the day, solar radiates in, and, and uh, during the night, it radiates out, and it warms up the water. Uh, so the upper red layer is something that, that is shown where the water is made. The first few meters are, are, are mostly affected. And one of the consequences of too high temperature is coral bleaching. But what we found in, in, in a study of a lot, like around 150 um, projects in the Netherlands, uh, measuring the water temperature with uh, underwater drones under the platforms and the water temperature next to it, is that the, an average of 0.5% lower um, uh, degrees were found. So, so 
this could be a really interesting thing to work with here. Of course, there are a lot of other um, influences that, that could change the, this number, the, how fast the water um, is, is flowing underneath the platform, etc. But, but it is something that we would really look, would like, want to look into. It has a lot of potential. Moreover, uh, the use of water from SWAC, uh, that the water is um, a lot uh, less warm than the water in the, in the sea, maybe we could do something with that uh, and see how discharging a little less warm water than in the, ocean, uh, the ocean has at the moment could maybe be even a benefit. Um, so I don't know, my time, okay, <laughs> still good. Um, a, th a third, and a, this is the last one I'm going to talk about, is uh, nutrients. The main production of nutrients uh, are people, uh, at least the nutrients uh, from the platforms, and we can think of waste, wastewater, and we, that is something that we should not uh, be dumping re uh, in the water uh, without uh, purifying. So nutrients are really important to s support primary production of uh, coral reefs. But uh, too much nutrients would cause the invasive species or to, uh, to, uh, an algae bloom um, and that would actually eventually lead to, um, well on the one side, uh, extreme algae blooms and on the other side, hypoxia. That could lead, that is lack of oxygen, that's not really good for, for fish and other organisms as well. So again with this, uh, we of course need to install a proper waste treatment system. These are available, uh, so we just have to install this and, and test other new technologies that maybe can also be adapted uh, to use on land. Reuse the nutrients as a resource for production of algae for biofuel uh, and other things. And uh, the recommendation would be to measure these nutrient levels. So the general um, study has, has been uh, finalized now, but we, ha we still have a, a, a few steps to go. So the next step will be to select the exact, oh yes, I'm going to run up, the exact C zone. So we have to point out this is the location we want to start. We need to do a baseline study there and define the control zones and the benchmarks. And then, uh, well, we'll see uh, what the results will be. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attention. <laughs> and I thank you. Thank you so much, Karina, for your presentation.